Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Good morning, our friend. How are you, Afrin? Or Afrin? Is it Afrin or Afrin? Afrin, sir. Afrin. Yes, sir. Yeah. Where did you say you studied Afrin? In Vanparthi district, sir. Sorry? Vanparthi district, private... Uh... College, sir. Vanita. Nivedita College in Vanparthi district. Oh, in Vanaparthi district. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. 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 All right. I think we should get going because then we'll uh, not be able to complete what we need to. And as it is, this is a bit of a problem unit because there are uh, a number of things that have to be dealt with. Uh, so we are uh, talking about the social contractualists. And in that, we are talking about the social contract as a modern mechanism So, we are claiming let me do, let's not waste space and I won't have space.
I thought I was not recording. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Um, this is the framework within which we are going to be discussing the social contractualists. And uh, I told you, we will be talking about uh, three social contractualists. Uh, the first of them is Thomas Hobbes, uh, and uh, the second is John Locke, both of who are Englishmen, and the uh, third is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, who's a Frenchman. And I told you that uh, <clears throat> each of these uh, contractualists has a different kind of a contract in mind. Uh, and uh, just because they are all social contractualists does not mean that their philosophies are very similar. Now, there is a, an unfortunate tendency, uh, especially in uh, the, the academic circles, of uh, Hyderabad, uh, and this unfortunate tendency is the equation of liberalism with democracy. That is because you have been through a syllabus, uh, <clears throat> which was, uh, sorry about my voice, uh, which was about uh, now I'm 30 years old or more than that. And uh, at somebody, whoever framed that syllabus, framed everything in terms of binaries. And what uh, I mean by binaries is that uh, everything is either liberal, democrat liberal democratic or uh, it is Marxist. So if you look at your uh, philosophy, uh, sorry, your syllabi that you did in your BA, and if any of you have done it, uh, if you've done uh, uh, CEC in uh, intermediate, you will find that this is the binary that is repeated and reinforced. That binary, should not be, should not exist at all. Seriously speaking, it should not exist at all. And uh, there's more to the world, leave the leave alone the world, there's more to liberalism as a philosophy than just democracy being tagged to it. And uh, we have what is actually called uh, a <clears throat> we have uh, that which is uh, actually called a, what should I say um, a democratic theory that talks about how this uh, marriage between liberal philosophy and democracy happened. Um, and for that, we have to thank political economy, actually. And uh, hence, uh, we should look at liberal philosophy as a system of thought and not necessarily as a system of uh, government institutions, democratic, early dem modern democratic theory, like I said, is more a product of the political economy of uh, people like uh, John Locke, most primarily John Locke, to a little extent, uh, Adam Smith, and it goes down to Ricardo, Thomas Maltes, uh, 
<clears throat> so it does go down to all these people. And uh, that is something which has to be understood uh, separately and differently from the philosophy that is liberalism. And it is because of these complex uh, equations that exist in uh, uh, the modern period and the early modern period that uh, I chose to take classes throughout your summer because uh, very happily people said libertarianism, Rawlsian liberalism, without saying anything whatsoever about liberalism. And uh, we were supposed to do that simultaneously with this. So that's why I asked you to come through the vacation for classes on political ideology so that I could do some uh, acquaintance uh, with liberalism as such without the understanding of which you will not be able to understand any of those things that have been included in that paper uh, designated political ideologies. None of the things that are there are political ideologies. They are philosophies, not ideologies in any sense of the term. Uh, so I had to clarify even that, and that took quite a bit of time. I hope you remember those things. Um, so anyway, so to come back to what we have to talk about, we are talking about how social contract is a modern mechanism. Okay, and I will not tire of telling you that if you look at the modern period, you have to understand that what differentiates it, what differentiates it is these four Fs. I've changed the order a bit because the first uh, three of them uh, refer to the individual. Uh, and even the fourth refers to the individual, uh, the market, but nevertheless, this is more about the inside process of a liberal person's brain and not something that uh, is about a, an entity which is outside of the individual. So free thinking, which is a reprieve from the dogmas and the dogmatic thought that was advocated by the church. Freedom of speech, and I told you, don't call it free speech. People are calling it all the time. Newspapers are publishing it. Free speech is different um, from freedom of speech. Freedom of speech is also freedom of expression uh, of your ideas free will. Free will is the will that you have to determine yourself, unlike in the feudal period where uh, people who belong to a particular feudal uh, professional guild by uh, birth didn't have the choice uh, to go on to another profession. So there was no free will. You couldn't will and do whatever you wanted to. And uh, free will is a very, very important concept because it's a recurrent theme. Okay, um, uh, if you look at uh, Rousseau, Rousseau talks about the general will, which is derived out of the notion of the free will. If you look at uh, Immanuel Kant, then Kant talks about the good will, the will that is good. And that again is, is a derivation 
from free will and if you ask Kant, he will say that he gave a better uh, explanation uh, of what Rousseau had in mind when he talked about uh, the general will. So uh, the thing that we are looking at therefore is that this is a, an extremely important component and so is freedom of speech. Even today we are talking about uh, freedom of speech and if Father Stanislaus uh, Swami dies, then people are up in arms against his having spoken uh, and expressed himself about what happened in Bhima Koregaon uh, and therefore he was jailed. So uh, we talk about all these things and uh, we don't want fettered thinking in the modern period. So, and also to the free market. Uh, and I told you in the medieval period, the feudatories and various others in the feudal uh, hierarchy decided where one could set up a market yard. Initially, the word market meant uh, a market yard. Okay, and um, they decided where it could be set up. They decided what could be sold in a market uh, yard designated in a particular place. And uh, they also decided because usually they were given bribes uh, by various people to reduce competition. They were given bribes by people and uh, it is these bribes that people took which drove up the costs of the articles that they were selling. And so there was also the phenomenon of price fixation. Okay. Uh, price fixation, one excellent example of that is what we find in India in the form of MRP. Okay. Uh, minimum retail price. That is a, an attempt at price fixation uh, by uh, an association of traders who trade in certain uh, commodities and they will say that this will be the minimum uh, retail price. And um, therefore I had uh, said this to you on a number of occasions. Our government, though we claim to be socialist and all that kind of thing, uh, our government uh, at one time, <coughs> sorry, periodically ran a campaign. And uh, what was the substance of the campaign? The substance of the campaign was Jago Grahak Jago, which is wake up consumer, wake up. And uh, what they were saying in those uh, advertisements, which they said was for uh, public good, they said uh, it is not the government uh, that fixes this. Uh, it's not the government that fixes this uh, MRP. This is done by the Association of Traders or Manufacturers. And uh, therefore, you don't have to, um, you don't really have to accept that as some kind of a legal thing. 
So they said, you have every right to bargain. You have every right to bargain. Uh, so even in an environment which people call socialism, even in that kind of an environment, there was a talk of this idea that there can be no price fixation. So please remember the free market basically means you can set up a market anywhere. And if there is a market yard somewhere, then you can sell whatever goods you have in that particular market and you can quote a price and it is up to the consumer who will basically examine uh, the product that you're selling, compare it with other products which are similar or, uh, uh, or are the same and uh, will compare the prices being quoted by being quoted by uh, different sellers and uh, they will buy that particular product which they think has the best value for money proposition which is value for money is not something which is inexpensive but you look at a product as having a number of attributes, qualities, uh, including quality itself, good quality, its versatility, all those things you take into consideration. And uh, even if the price is slightly higher, you just might decide that we'll buy this because this seems to offer a better value for the money that we are paying. So it, value for money is not necessarily the cheapest. Okay. It is what are you getting for the money that you are investing? All right. I don't tire of talking about these four things because of the fact that uh, maybe you're getting tired of them, but I suggest don't. Because if I wake you up in the middle of the night and ask you, give me the four freedoms uh, that uh, are supposed to be the hallmark of the modern period, then you should be able to give me this. You must be able to, without thinking, you should be able to recite these four different things. Free thinking, freedom of speech, free will, and a free market. So, I have forgotten to put the most important thing here. This led to the emergence of Let me use an ampersand. It will save space, uh, individualism and capitalism. Um, so we are looking at a society which is now turned upside down. Okay, uh, you must understand, you must understand if Aristotle was right, or if any of the ancients or pre-modern uh, philosophers were right in their belief that without a society, you can't have an individual. If you believe in that, if you ask yourself this question, if they were right, uh, and uh, the examples that I have given you will reinforce the rightness of what uh, 
the ancient philosophers and the pre-modern philosophers said, which is the whole comes before the parts, right? Uh, which is also how India was created. We first created an entity called India, and then we decided to see how best to divide it into uh, different states in order to uh, administer the country more efficiently. Uh, and I told you that can you have a soldier without having an army? Okay, can you have a soldier without having an army? Can you have an employee without having a business organization or a company, any of these things. Can you have an employee without the company? So if all that is true, then what is this individualism and why are we supporting it? Or is anyone supporting it? Obviously it is being supported. And it is being supported because you have to understand that starting with Machiavelli, who is not a fully modern thinker, but is a proto-modern thinker. I have told you many times, a proto is a prototype. Okay, uh, it is a prototype. And uh, we're looking at a proto-modern uh, thinker. And uh, this proto-modern thinker was conducting an experiment. So if you look at the prince, the prince is a work of experiment. OK? And I hope you re remember the resolutive compositive method that I talked about when we talked about the emergence of uh, sciences. Uh, we did so in the case of political ideologies. We talked about positivism uh, and we talked about empiricism uh, and uh, if you remember that stuff, which I sincerely, sincerely hope you do, because that is of utmost importance now. Okay, uh, I'll just quickly run through what the resolutive compositive method is. The resolutive compositive method is a challenge mounted by the school of Padua or simply called the Paduans against the idea that was being promoted by the church that if you did not create something, then you can't understand what that is. That is the idea that is promoted by the church. Okay, so they said, have faith. God will reveal knowledge to you. And therefore, they said anybody who's trying to use his own uh, rationality is somebody who is uh, actually under the influence of the devil and is losing his faith in God. And the, <clears throat> sorry, the Paduans debunked this particular theory with the resolutive compositive method, which is the earliest scientific method. And if you remember what I told you, this was the time when the clock had been invented. And I had told you that when any invention happens, first and foremost, you have things which are very big, very, very big. Okay. And uh, it's the fine honing of technology that uh, leads to these things becoming smaller and smaller. 
Today, people believe that with nanotechnology, it is possible to create a cell phone uh, of the size that an ant can use. Now, this is this is not some stupid uh, sci-fi kind of a uh, uh, thing. Not at all. It is something which is uh, very much in the realm of the possible. And if you look at uh, various invasive procedures that are done today, where probes are sent into the body, how big do you think the camera is? A camera that is going into your veins or arteries, how big can it be? Seriously, have you ever seen a vein or an artery? How wide is it in terms of its opening? Is it even this much? You can now send a camera right into the body, to any part of the body, through the system, the network of veins and arteries, and you can probe what the problem is with a person. It is done for heart patients. At one time it was done for uh, uh, even those who had back problems. There was a thing called a myelogram where they sent a probe into your vertebral column right next to the spine, it was sent in uh, to see what was the problem with your vertebral column or with the discs in the, vertebr uh, the vertebral column. It was called a myelogram. Very painful procedure, very, very painful procedure. Nowadays, mercifully, it has been uh, abandoned in favor of uh, what is called the MRI. And with uh, the MRI, you also have uh, the contrast MRI, where they first inject a dye, and then they do a magnetic resonance imaging, which is what the MRI is. And that shows you the picture of whatever you want to see in the spine and the vertebral column. I'm a veteran of all these. I've undergone all these procedures. So while you're undergoing them, it's not at all, um, not at all uh, an experience that you would want, but I have to marvel at sending something down your spine. That's really amazing. Uh, you also have what is called a carotid angiogram. And uh, a carotid angiogram from the neck, a probe is sent into your brain. And if, I don't know if you're aware of this, the uh, most number of blood vessels in your body are there from your neck upwards. Neck upwards, you have the maximum number of blood vessels. And if you want to see if there's some kind of an aneurysm in the brain, or if you want to see anything, you send a probe into it. Okay, so technology improves with time. 
and uh, the resolutive compositive method. I'm not going to talk to you about that. Uh, set off these developments. It was the most nascent of the, uh, it was the most nascent of the scientific methods. Uh, and uh, it set the tone for later scientific discoveries. So you had science also coming in at a time when individualism and capitalism came into being. And King Henry the Eighth, who the world treats as a notorious figure, did the biggest favor to the British and made them the global power that they were. He made them the global power that they were. A parallel is Richard Nixon, another person who was abhorred even by the Americans, even by the Americans. But what he did for the Americans is an immeasurable thing in terms of giving them We are coming to him. I'm coming to him. So he did something immeasurable by abolishing the gold standard and which is what gave them power. So what we basically need to understand what we basically need to understand is that there are these individuals whose contribution is tremendous. Henry VIII's contribution is tremendous because of the fact that he converted a country completely into Protestantism. That has not happened anywhere else in any other Christian country. It was left to the uh, uh, people to either stay on with what was the Roman Church, which designated itself the Catholic Church, and uh, or it was up to them to embrace this new form of thought, which was something that uh, was advocated by uh, Martin Luther, uh, which is the Protestantism. Um, and I talked to you about the Protestant ethic, so I'm not going to go into that again. It is, in all these, in the concatenation of all these different circumstances that you have the emergence of social contractualism. And I told you that the earliest phase Some people also call it mercantile capitalism. Mercantilism comes from merchants. Merchants were those who were actually traders. It's a bit of an archaic word for traders. Uh, what did these traders do? They went to 
different countries which were known for their prosperity and uh, these people basically were looking at buying some of those things that were available only in these markets and uh, taking them back to Europe. It was in that context yesterday that we talked about uh, Chinggis Chan, who became Genghis Khan. Uh, and uh, so they came to India, they went to China to buy spices, condiments, as that's not all, they also bought cloth that was so finely woven, so finely woven that a sari of nine yards could be folded and fitted into a box which you get with the soap, the outer packing. You could fold and put it into that. That was the skill of the artisans of India and presumably of China too. Otherwise, why would people go to China also? So they came here these lands represented a nobility in terms of the food, the condiments needed for the making of that food, and also other articles which were completely alien to the European culture. So the mercantilist phase was heated up in Great Britain, in England, thanks to the reformation process initiated in the country by King Henry VIII and by doing so, by accelerating the process, he made sure that they will go on to the next level. And the next level So the next level is industrial capitalism. And uh, in this you have mechanized production. The last time I batch that I taught Western political philosophy to, which was uh, 
in uh, PG College, I spoke about the industrial revolution that led to the industrial capitalism. Uh, and for many, it is a conundrum, a riddle, if you like, that the Renaissance happened in Italy, the revival of classical learning. The growth of science happened there. The resolutive comp compositive method was in Padua, which is in Italy. You had Galileo in Italy. And uh, then the reformation process, that particular process started in Germany with Martin Luther. If you like, you can also credit Savonarola uh, with that, an Italian. But the real uh, reformation started with Martin Luther, a German, and the Protestant ethic is a result of the reformation and the effects of both the Renaissance and the reformation, including the Protestant ethic were felt in England, up in England. Look at the map, it's up there. So what is the secret? The secret is no secret, I just told you. It's Henry VIII. By converting the entire country into Protestantism, into creating the Anglican church and making the monarch of England the head of the Anglican church, he removed the religious basis of the church. He removed the religious basis of the church. You didn't have to be a qualified man of God like the Pope in order to head a church. You could be a king and that to one hell of a womanizer of a king who could be the head of the church. All that accelerated uh, the mercantilist phase moved on to the next phase, which was the industrial phase. So the secret behind England reaping the benefits of processes that began in Italy and in, uh, and in uh, Germany is nothing but this act of Henry VIII. So the British have a lot to thank for when they talk about Henry VIII, because it was because of him that uh, they had what no other country had. And the small little island the small little island became one of the most dominant powers in the world. So, well, the third phase of capitalism
this is the third phase of capitalism. Yesterday, Mr. Akshay asked me a question. Which is a more stable form of economy? Socialist economy, is that more stable? Or uh, is capitalist economy a more stable economy? So, at that time, I told him that socialism was destroyed by Joseph Stalin uh, by pursuing a policy of dictatorship and it was further destroyed by uh, the USSR engaging in an arms race with the USA, a country which was far, far more developed than the USSR and it had deeper pockets so it could sustain losses for a longer period and wait for profits. That is what the venture capitalist does. Who are venture capitalists? Venture capitalists are these stinking rich people who have more money than the whole world requires stashed away. And what do they do? If they like an idea, they invest in it. They invest in that particular idea and they wait and they wait for 10 years, 15 years. They wait for that to make profits. So Google began with venture capitalists. And if you've seen the movie, the social media, it'll tell you how venture capitalists backed Facebook and Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, and uh, if you look at Twitter, till today, it is backed by venture capitalists. It hasn't gone for an IPO, initial public offering, which is a listing on NASDAQ, which is the, like a stock exchange. Okay, so the venture capitalists have money. They back ideas which they think uh, are the ones that will ultimately fetch them profits and they are willing to wait. That is something that was not there in the USSR and therefore the USSR collapsed. It didn't have any more money. It collapsed. Now, if you ask me this question, is a capitalist economy uh, more resilient? Is it more stable? Marx felt it wasn't, but I think he's been proved wrong. Because if you look at capitalism, we have the advantage of seeing capitalism for 150 years more than Marx saw it. And it looks like uh, Max Weber had a better insight into capitalism than Marx did because he said capitalism is not going to die. And the reason why he said it is not going to lie is because he said it is a legal system. Okay, he said it's a legal uh, system which has the capacity to settle problems. Okay, it has a capacity to settle problems uh, through deliberations and courts of law. And so he said it's not going to fall. So he seems to be right. And the third phase of finance monopoly capitalism gives us an insight. What is it doing? 
finance monopoly capitalism. People buy up companies. I was talking to you the other day about the difference between the internet and the World Wide Web. The internet has been around since the 60s. Email attached to the internet has been around since 1969. And uh, that email required people. It basically required people to base, uh, to log on to their own computer. So the internet was a networking of computers. It is a networking of computers. But Tim Berners-Lee, when he sold the protocol of the World Wide Web, that didn't sit on one computer. It sat on servers which could be accessed by various different computers from anywhere in the world. So you have the idea of mail that is web-based. And what is the advantage of web-based email? The advantage of web-based email is you can access it on any computer anywhere in the world. Anywhere in the world. And that is how Google, the search engine came into being so that people can search the web the search engines crawl the web. Okay, and uh, I told you that uh, this is the digital economy of today. But what you need to understand is that capitalism has seen various parallel developments. The finance monopoly capitalism part refers to, it basically refers to the idea that uh, those entities that are not doing very well financially, capitalist entities that are not doing very well financially and which have a prospect of doing well, they will be picked up by bigger companies. They will be picked up by bigger companies. Let me not waste too much time. Just let me give you a very, very good example of a finance monopoly. The finance monopoly that you should talk about these days is this particular company called Stellantis. Anyone heard of this? No. Stellantis
Well, the list goes on, okay? Another uh, uh, conglomerate like this is Fox Wagon. which has 11 brands across the world under it. They are a part of the Volkswagen group. 11 brands. You have Volkswagen, you have Skoda, you have, uh, what is, uh, uh, yeah, uh, you have Scania, you have Ducati, you have Bugatti, you have Lamborghini, uh, you have Audi, all these are Volkswagen companies, 11 of them. So they are a finance monopoly. All these brands which were struggling to do well, they were all picked up. They were all picked up. And uh, you think you're buying an Audi, which is different from a Volkswagen. It isn't. The underlying platform is the same. So that's how finance monopoly capitalism works. Now what you need to realize Hobbes Sorry. Yeah, that's all right. In the time of Hobbes, capitalism was just being born. Modernity had come into being. Free thinking had come into being. Freedom of speech had, well, was coming into being. Uh, free will was also coming into being. It was uh, almost fully developed, but the free market hadn't developed fully. But the market mechanism, the market mechanism had developed. And it was moving in the direction of a free market. It was moving in the direction of a free market. 
So it isn't as if there was no market mechanism at all. This market mechanism that he saw was in between the old market yard uh, controlled by various people versus something that is free market. So he saw a hybrid situation. What he saw was a hybrid situation. And therefore, Thomas Hobbes invokes freedom of thought. He invokes freedom of speech. He invokes your freedom to will what you want to be. But he doesn't really invoke the free market fully. He doesn't invoke that. So, what is the liberal thing about him then? Here, liberalism is still a philosophy and the liberalism of Hobbes is possessive individualism that he shows. I'll come to a discussion on this shortly. So Hobbes represents the first phase of capitalism, the first phase of modernity and the just emerging phase of liberalism. The emerging first phase of liberalism, which is seen in his possessive individualism. The social contract It reflects that he's a proto-liberal, not he has elements which are very, very liberal, but he's not a full-fledged liberal thinker. So you will find that his social contractualist mechanism or his social contract reflects this. Then you look at the second phase, John Locke. I'm not going to write uh, the names of the economists uh, because we are students of political science. It would be nice if uh, we could study a bit of their economics as well. But we do have this uh, paucity of time and uh, we also have this rather impatient individual uh, called Akshay who's uh, telling me to get on with it uh, and I've been resisting it. He sent me that message about half an hour ago. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, and uh, so John Locke, why have I put a comma, represents the second phase and is a full liberal thinker 
and integrates politics with economics not the other way around hmm not the other way around he doesn't integrate economic with economics with politics he integrates politics with economics to create his social contract which is very different from hobbyian contract it's very different from that here we see the support to a free market that has now emerged and an industrial revolution which has begun in great britain england and you must understand that the industrial revolution was not an overnight revolution i was trying to tell you the last time i taught this uh, i taught the various phases of the industrial revolution uh, it is in fact a very very fascinating topic the evolution of technologies to whatever level that they have evolved uh, is in itself something that is so fascinating and when you start relating that to the economies um, then it becomes even more fascinating uh, it gives you a kick but i don't think any of you have either the patience or the inclination to go with that so i'm going to give the phases of the industrial revolution ms anyway uh, so you told you the next topic in one of the evening classes yeah but i'm going to give it a ms for today okay yeah or for at this time maybe the evening classes maybe okay uh right so that is the thing now let's uh, look at i wouldn't call this the third phase i will say the next phase
So what I said about Rousseau uh, is uh, not the full truth. When I say that Rousseau wants a full democracy, because Rousseau revels in contradictions, uh, I have not seen any other thinker like Rousseau. Rousseau really revels in contradictions. He offers you solutions to a Ah, oh, let me just. Um, Please read that as limited government and uh, nation state. Okay, Locke is a supporter of private property, limited government and of the nation state. Hobbes is also a supporter of a nation state. Well, there's nothing I can do about that. Right, so... <clears throat> so Rousseau wants a full democracy, but he also gives you a completely, completely... Uh, what should I say? Opposite alternative, where there's no democracy at all. There's only one person who he calls the, uh, what should I say, the universal legislator. And this universal legislator is somebody who embodies the general will and makes laws uh, which will be uh, <clears throat> which will be good for the citizens, all of them. There is no exclusion of people in uh, Rousseau as there is in uh, Hobbes, uh, sorry, in Locke. Law, uh, Hobbes also doesn't exclude anyone. Uh, and uh, Rousseau doesn't want a nation state He wants a city. So Russo wants a city state, not a nation state. Okay. Uh, and Russo also offers you two kinds of city states one which he calls a village somewhere in nature and the other which he calls the Greek uh, polis Sparta. Okay. Um, so this is the broad structure of the social contractualists. I have decided to talk to you first and foremost uh, 
about capitalism and the modern uh, idea of modernism so that you understand the graded difference that comes in all the three different contractualists. Hobbes is attempt, uh, attempting a social contract which generates one kind of a state. Locke is attempting a social contract which generates a completely different kind of state. And uh, Rousseau is talking about no nation state at all. No nation state at all. So if you, if you kind of uh, look at all these things, you see that they have been clubbed together as social contractualists. And uh, they are the three social contractualists. There are more than them, by the way. There are many more than them. Uh, all these three social contractualists uh, are as different as cheese and uh, marmite. If you don't know what is marmite, my sincere and humble suggestion is get yourself, go to one of these you know, newfangled, highfalutin supermarkets, you'll get Marmite, M-A-R-M-A-I-T-E. Not Marmalade, huh? Marmite. Eat it with one slice of bread and you'll go off food for the rest of your life. That's a guarantee. I'm throwing you a challenge. If anybody eats Marmite and tells me I loved it, I want to eat more of it truthfully, I shall give you a 5,000 rupee cash price. I'm serious about this. Hmm? Very, what very. Like it? Sorry? What if you like in saying that you have no, nah, no, nah. if I tell you what it is like, then what is the point in having the challenge? No, no, I'm saying what if we lie? What is the? What if we lie, L-I-E, that we liked it, tasting? Uh, no, if, what if you like, is that what you're saying? If you're saying, what if we like, uh, I'll pay you 5,000 rupees, cash price. But you have to be truthful, huh? She's saying, if we lie, lie. What? That's what I'm trying to tell you. You have to be truthful. That's what I'm trying to say. I'm going to take your word for it. Or I'll make you do one thing. I'll make you eat Marmite every day. Hmm? It is made up of yeast. Sorry? It is made up of yeast. Yes, it is. How does it taste like? No, I'm not going to tell you that. I'm not going to tell you that. Uh, my half British wife and her full British mother, they love Marmite and 
So they were having Marmite and I said, let's have Marmite. And I had Marmite and I think it took me two weeks to eat again. The, the British are crazy. What is it, sir? It's a, instead of putting butter, jam on a slice of bread, you put marmite. You toast a bread or even untoasted bread, put marmite on it, eat it. I'll take your word for it. So, be truthful. It says it is salty like soya sauce or more than that. <laughs> Reading is not going to be a substitute for eating. Okay. Yeah. So, I'll take your word for it. If you lie also, I'll say, okay, she lied. She liked it. I'll take it as a truth. <laughs> I'll take it as truth and give you 5,000 rupees. And if Akshay likes it, I'll give him 7,000. Hmm? Additional 2,000 because Akshay is my conscience keeper. And now my timekeeper as well. Yeah. So, right. Now, when I uh, meet you tomorrow, when I meet you tomorrow, I shall be, I don't want to start anything now. It says 10.37. So when I meet you tomorrow for this class, Akshay, for half an hour or a little less perhaps, I shall first talk about how capitalism came into being as a refresher for your people. I have talked about how all these variables that have been cited, race, ethnicity, culture, regionalism, uh, as being the basis of, uh, um, as being the basis of, uh, uh, nationalism are all bogus they are completely bogus and i shall tell you that it is uh, the uh, necessity of capitalism or the necessities of capitalism which led to the emergence of nation states in the form in which they did and uh, that will kind of quite nicely coincide if we can have a meeting tomorrow evening, if we can have a class. Uh, you know, but I had promised that for get, get the hell out of here. Yeah, sorry, that wasn't you. Um, so those things, uh, I'll kind of... Uh, what should I say? Uh, I'll uh, I'll kind of um, describe if we need to look beyond the nation state now. If we need to look uh, at uh, if we need to look at transnationalism or cosmopolitanism do we really need nation states anymore because at one time they served a purpose Eric Hobsbawm uh, long ago wrote a book called after the nation state and it's a brilliant book uh, and then there are these jurists and jurisprudence thinkers uh, like Jeremy Waldron and uh, the great Ronald Dorkin, uh, who will uh, 
um, who will argue against nationalism and they'll say it's parochial. They'll say it's parochial. And uh, many years ago, centuries ago, Samuel Johnson had already said patriotism and nationalism are the last refuge of the scoundrel. Uh, so I really don't know. I think it's worth having a discussion on that, which will become inevitable when we talk about Ronald Dawkin. But I'm afraid to start Ronald Dawkin for obvious reasons. My time is up. Please go to Madam Yasmin's class. She'll tell you how wonderfully she did yesterday in the interview and how people were eating out of her hands. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Bye. Thank you, sir. Righto. Bye. Thank sir. you, sir. Thank you. See you in the evening.